Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Adam Hart, curator and archivist at the nonprofit Media Burn Archive based in Chicago, Illinois. We collect, produce, and distribute documentary and experimental video created by artists, activists, and community members. Um, our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. Um, I will say, if you would like to see our footage in action, uh, all the beauty and the bloodshed, uh, Laura Poitras's fantastic documentary about Nan Golden, um, features some really remarkable footage shot by Skip Blumberg that you can see uh, in full on the Media Burn website. Um, in the, uh, if you've seen it, the protest about the censorship of uh, Golden's AIDS-themed uh, art show. Um, so tonight's event is part of an ongoing free series called Virtual Talks with Video Activists, which brings together media producers, scholars, and viewers to discuss the art and politics of video and of documentary. Uh, upcoming events include in two weeks, Judith Bender talking about CamNet, the world's first and only all camcorder network, a sort of open submission video journalism network that became the venue for some of the most interesting and provocative video work of the 1990s. Tonight, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome Jill Godmillow, filmmaker, author, and teacher, along with Ricky Herbs, curator for Notre Dame Cinema, for a screening and discussion of Jill's new film, Notes and Images from the Vietnam War. Uh, before we begin, we ask that you all remain muted during the screening so that everyone can hear clearly. When it's time for the Q&A after the screening, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat. You're welcome to ask questions out loud as well. And if you'd like to do that, you can virtually raise your hand to be called on. Uh, to raise your hand, look for the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom screen, click it, and some options will pop up, including one to raise your hand. If you have trouble finding this feature, you can always write in the chat that you'd like to be called on. We'd also like to point out that this event is being live captioned. There are two ways of viewing the captions as subtitles on the bottom of the screen or in a live transcript window that will open up separately. To turn the captions on or off or to switch between the subtitle and the live transcript, look for the live transcript button at the bottom of the screen and click the arrow on the top right. If you enjoy the event tonight and want to share it with others, the event is being recorded and will be posted online within a few days. We'll send you an email when the recording is available. All right, so tonight we have with us Jill and Ricky. Jill Godmello is Professor Emerita at the Department of Film, Television and Theater at the University of Notre Dame. Her acclaimed films include the Academy Award nominated Antonia, A Portrait of the Woman, uh, Waiting for the Moon, which won Best Feature at the Sundance Film Festival, and What Faraki Taught, which was featured at the 2000 Whitney Biennial and is a favorite of mine. Um, in 2015, she was knighted by President Komorowski of Poland and awarded the Knight's Cross for the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland for her film Far From Poland. She is the author, author of the absolutely wonderful a uh, new book, Kill the Documentary, a letter to filmmakers, students, and scholars from Columbia University Press. It is Media Burn approved and endorsed, and I suggest that you all run out and buy it if you are uh, interested in the sort of thing that Media Burn does. Ricky Herbst is the cinema program manager at the University of Notre Dame's Browning Cinema, where he curates its year-round screenings, exhibitions, and film festivals. He has a background in film and nonprofit arts, but also in law and criminology, holding a master's of philosophy in criminological research from the University of Cambridge and a JD from Yale Law, in addition to a BA in psychology and in film, television, and theater from Notre Dame, where he was one of Jill's students. Um, we want to get to the film uh, pretty quickly, but uh, Jill, would you like to set the stage for everybody, introduce uh, introduce the film and what you want them to know, the context you want them to know going in? Oh, you're you're muted, Jill.
still muted. Okay. There you now? go. Now? Now? Good. All right. Very simply, this is not a film like any other film I've ever made. I made it because Ken Burns announced that he was making his 17-hour documentary about the war in Vietnam. And I thought, how the hell is anybody going to use a 17-hour film? And um, so, because I care about high school students trying to teach this impossible war, I made a 45-minute film and offer it free to high school teachers to use uh, because it, like I said, it's a very complicated war and a horrible war. And uh, it wouldn't be easy to talk about it in one class, which is all they get for Vietnam. So somehow I ended up making a 45 minute film, 44, I think, um, for them. And of course I offer it to anybody else, but that's the legacy of this film. And um, and now we can watch it. Thanks so much, Jill. Max, whenever you're ready. A friend told me that high school teachers of American history say the three hardest things to explain to students are, one, the failure of Reconstruction after the Civil War in the South, and the new Jim Crow laws, a disaster for the civil rights of African Americans. Two, westward expansion, genocidal wars against Native American populations, 10 million massacred, and three, the tragic Vietnam War and I mean tragic. The Vietnam War may be the hardest U.S. war to explain. It went on for roughly 20 long years in a tiny country in Asia, 8,000 miles from the United States. Vietnam was an impoverished country of rice farmers, 80% Buddhist. More than 3,500,000 Vietnamese died, and in neighboring countries, 600,000 Cambodians and 70,000 Laotians were also killed. And more than 58,000 U.S. soldiers, sailors, and pilots died fighting there. It's not a nice story. Actually, it's not a story at all. A classical story or narrative goes like this. Two men set off across a valley, had many adventures, and returned home safely. Almost no one returned home safely from Vietnam which is typical of all wars. Vietnam is now revered all over the world because like David in the Bible, 
they defeated the most powerful Goliath in the world with the largest, most powerful, and deadly military force than any known to mankind. America tells this war very differently, driven by an absolute craving to cover up national shame. U.S. memories of the Vietnam War have been consigned to a strange netherworld, always in the background, hardly ever confronted. I have only 45 minutes of your time, so I'll tell you this not a story as fast as I can with just photographs, so we can look long and hard into them and see for ourselves what the photographers saw. Here's a brief and complicated history, the whys and wherefores of the U.S. war in Vietnam, just the bare bones of this story. Please follow along as best you can. Vietnam, far away, fragrant, colorful, seductive, a mysterious land reminiscent of ceiling fans, French baguettes, straw hats, and bicycles laden with goods, a peasant country the size of Arizona. The U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam, roughly from 1955 to 1975, was fueled by a toxic fear of communism, an imperial ambition for a land base in Asia, and eventually a near-psychotic fear of losing face. Once we started it, we couldn't quit, as more and more resources were invested each year through five U.S. presidents, none of whom were capable of admitting defeat. In the late 19th century, the French colonized, ruled, and exploited Vietnam for 80 years before losing it to the Japanese during World War II. After the war, the French fought to reimpose colonial rule, but this time fiercely opposed by a new guerrilla movement for self-determination, led by the revolutionary Viet Minh in the North. The Viet Minh was a national liberation organization intent on unification of their country and supported by the communist governments of nearby China and the Soviet Union. September 2nd, 1945, the Viet Minh leader, Ho Chi Minh, declared Vietnam's independence from France, quoting from our own Declaration of Independence and asking for help from the U.S., which was never offered. After nine years of fierce battles, the Viet Minh finally beat the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and the French withdrew from Vietnam. In 1954, the International Geneva Convention, charged with dismantling French Indochina, extracted the former colonies of Cambodia and Laos, and admits contentious struggles between various parties temporarily separated Vietnam into two zones. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam was to rule the North under a communist government, and the South became the newly created Republic of Vietnam, with its capital in Saigon. The Geneva Accords stipulated that elections under international supervision were to be held in two years to reunite the country. It was widely expected that Ho Chi Minh would win the election and that he would become president of a unified Vietnam. The election never happened. By this point, the U.S. was unwilling to allow Vietnam to reunify under a communist government, proclaiming that the Vietnamese people weren't ready for independence. The new president of South Vietnam, Diem, a Catholic in a largely Buddhist country installed by and beholding to the U.S., was a notoriously corrupt politician and ruled his one-party authoritarian state brutally. His only virtue in American eyes was that he was not a communist and he did what he was told. He refused to participate in the election and began to clean the territory of communist sympathizers. He supported mainly Catholic landlords and businessmen and tried to dominate the rural Buddhist population. 
Why did the U.S. sabotage an election to unify a small state on the other side of the world? The U.S. had become the self-appointed champion of international opposition to the spread of communism after World War II and for 44 years led what was called the Cold War against communism. It said that the so-called domino theory dictated U.S. thinking, which proposed that if Vietnam became communist, other countries in the region would fall to communism, one by one, like dominoes. Here are some other useful explanations. As the, quote, leader of the free world, the U.S. wanted to prevent Vietnam from becoming another example of a social revolution for national independence, as Cuba had in 1958. Also, perhaps to gain control of natural resources of the region, rubber, tin, petroleum, rice, and other strategic commodities. Dem's South Vietnamese government had little support among its people, and in the South, the opposition formed a guerrilla group known to its enemies as the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong began to fight back against the brutal repression by the Diem regime and turned the tide against the South Vietnamese forces in 1963. Only after the war was well underway did large units from the North Vietnamese Army arrive on the Southern Front. The U.S.'s puppet, the Republic of South Vietnam, survived for 12 more years, only through an exorbitant investment of American money, guns, planes, and American and Vietnamese lives. The French President de Gaulle had warned Kennedy way back in May 1961, quote, you will find that intervention in this area will be an endless entanglement. Once a nation has been aroused, no foreign power, however strong, can impose its will upon it. The ideology which you invoked will make no difference. Indeed, in the eyes of the masses, it will become identified with your will to power. That is why the more you become involved out there against communism, the more the communists will appear as the champions of national independence and the more support they will receive. Very wise advice, but it fell on deaf ears. That year, Kennedy sent 400 combat troops to South Vietnam as, quote, advisors, unquote. U.S. involvement in the war increased dramatically over the following decade, and at the peak of fighting in 1969, the U.S. was using 550,000 of its own military personnel and thousands more from South Korea, Australia, and other allies. Here's the fundamental strategic flaw for the U.S. They proposed to create a viable, legitimate, democratic South Vietnam. But the more the U.S. intervened, the more the legitimacy of South Vietnam was undermined. Any hope of military victory for the U.S. and South Vietnam faded in 1965. Then the U.S. objective became to, quote, convince the enemy that he could not win, unquote, and would give up the battle. When the enemy remained unconvinced, the next U.S. goal appeared, quote, to avoid a humiliating defeat, which could sour the reputation of the United States and its president. The war went on for years until the U.S. was defeated and started pulling out its troops in 1973. Then Saigon fell to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, and the war was over. Now that you've heard the history, I'll try to summarize for you how the U.S. conducted this war against an indigenous peasant army in Vietnam. For Vietnam, it was an unleashing of advanced war technology on a rural peasant society. And for the U.S., a frontless war of endless frustration, death, and destruction. How do you fight a war when it's hard to distinguish Vietnamese friends from the enemy? 
you end up using tactics that target many civilians. It was a hopeless horror show, a very disheartening one. Please try not to turn away. These were our tactics, our strategies, our programs. There was Agent Orange. From 1961 to 71, under the code name Operation Ranch Hand, the U.S. military dropped more than 19 million gallons of toxic chemicals on South and Central Vietnam, primarily Agent Orange, an herbicide and defoliant which contains dioxin, one of the most toxic chemicals known to mankind. The goal of the program was to deprive Viet Cong fighters of food by destroying crops and also to destroy the jungle so they would have no cover, no place to hide. By 1971, 12% of the total area of South Vietnam had been sprayed with defoliating chemicals. Over 4 million people were directly exposed to Agent Orange, many of them multiple times. U.S. soldiers were also exposed, as Agent Orange was sprayed around the perimeter of U.S. bases to destroy the surrounding foliage so that incoming enemy could be spotted. Once Agent Orange is in the soil, the dioxin has a half-life of more than 100 years. It can get lodged in human DNA and be passed from generation to generation. No one knows when or even if it can ever be cleansed. To this day, it still has the capacity to damage unborn children through the uterus and then through mother's milk. 60 years after spraying began. Today, there are thousands of Vietnamese and American children born with missing fingers, extra fingers and toes, missing arms, feet, and eyes. A known carcinogen, it can cause stillbirths, cancers, skin lesions, heart problems, respiratory and other cancers, limb deformities, and reproductive system disorders. It impairs their immune and nervous systems and causes babies born with no brains. Without question, Operation Ranch Hand was the most destructive instance of chemical warfare in modern history. It was recently estimated that over 300,000 U.S. Vietnam vets had died from exposure to Agent Orange. There were cluster bombs, the U.S. dropped them all over South Vietnam. These were large casings filled with hundreds of small bomblets about the size of a baseball, designed to explode near ground level over a wide area, releasing metal fragments to maim and kill. Often the bombs failed to detonate. To this day, children find these metal balls on soccer fields and farmlands and toss these, quote, toys to one another in games of catch until they explode and children die. Since the end of the war in 1975, nearly 40,000 Vietnamese have been killed and 67,000 maimed by unexploded landmines, cluster bombs, and other ordnance. Around 800,000 tons remain scattered across the country. An enormous effort is underway to clear them from the landscape, but at the current rate, it will take 300 years the wars of the past continue to kill today. There was napalm. In a campaign called Operation Rolling Thunder, the U.S. dropped napalm bombs on Vietnamese civilians. Napalm is a mixture of sticky gel and an incendiary petrochemical which envelops everything it touches in inextinguishable fire. Napalm cannot be wiped off skin, even when burning, napalm will float on water. Within 80 yards of an exploding napalm bomb, survival is impossible. Napalm bombs were primarily dropped in rural areas, largely occupied by women and children. By the end of the war, a quarter million children were dead, and another three quarters of a million had been wounded or maimed. Napalm had been developed by Dow Chemical, famous at the time for its kitchen product, Saran Wrap, which was boycotted by anti-war civilians throughout the war. Then there are the programs that are harder to visualize, but no less horrific. There was the CIA's program of torture and assassination, the Phoenix Program. 
Vietnamese people suspected of being the enemy were tortured for information. Then their corpses were simply dumped. No formal prosecution, no record. By 1972, more than 26,000 Vietnamese people were victims of what was called pump and dump. They were free fire zones. These were areas of the countryside as large as 80 square miles, where bombing and shelling could be carried out without permission from higher ranks of the U.S. military, on the assumption that any human being encountered there must be the enemy. Free fire zones were designed to raise the number of, quote, kills, unquote. The goal was to make contact, kill as many people as possible, and move on in search of more. For the U.S. and Vietnam, the bottom line was the number of enemies killed, which was reported each day on the network evening news to encourage citizens to believe that the war could and would be won. There were Zippo raids, named for the popular cigarette lighters of the time, used by American soldiers to set villagers' huts on fire. Villages were then forced into resettlement camps, surrounded by barbed wire or sharpened stakes. By the end of the war, most of the villages in South Vietnam had been damaged or destroyed and millions of peasants driven from their homes by Zippo raids and napalm bombs. There was rape of Vietnamese women by U.S. soldiers. Rape and the subsequent murder of the women took place on such a large scale that many soldiers considered it standard operating procedure, an unofficial military policy. The macho racist culture fostered in the military contributed to the dehumanization of Vietnamese women and made this violence possible. Rape is a weapon of all wars, but here it was intensified by the prevalence of women in the North Vietnamese forces. The threat of an American soldier being killed by a female guerrilla resulted in greater violence against all Vietnamese women, not to mention racist indifference to the lives of, quote, gooks, slopes, dinks, and slant eyes, unquote. North Vietnamese, a revolutionary government seeking reunification and independence, had no choice but to defend themselves, to do everything in their power to force the U.S. to pack up and go home, which is what, in the end, they did. In April 1967, at Riverside Church in New York City, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. gave a talk called Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence. Here is how he described the people whose land we were burning and bombing. Quote, they watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas, preparing to destroy their precious trees. They wander into the towns and see thousands of children, homeless, without clothes, running in packs on the street like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. We are fighting a war. I'm convinced that it is one of the most unjust wars that has ever been fought in the history of the world. The tactics the United States used in Vietnam Agent Orange, torture, cluster bombs, free fire zones, Zippo raids, and napalm bombs were damaging to American soldiers as well, but in ways that we do not often talk about. This favor with the Vietnam War was common in the streets of America, but also common in the jungles, camps, and field hospitals of Vietnam, fueled by a spreading feeling among GIs that the war was meaningless and futile and that they had been lied to about why they were there. Of the more than 58,000 U.S. soldiers who died in Vietnam, the average age was 19. Many veterans are still haunted by unspeakable images, memories of buddies being shot or burned and dying. Thus, post-traumatic stress disorder is a normal and predictable reaction. Moral injury an injury to the individual's moral conscience and values from perpetrating acts of killing, torture, bombing, and more produces profound emotional guilt and shame, the heart and soul's reaction to unthinkable destruction. 
It's estimated that close to 200,000 Vietnamese veterans have committed suicide, a number that tells us a lot about the spiritual toll that war took on for survivors. To this day, many thousands of vets live on our streets, not only unrewarded, but even disadvantaged by their service. In 1971, we learned of the Pentagon Papers, a 7,000-page top-secret government study of U.S. decision-making under Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. It demonstrated unconstitutional behavior by these three presidents, the violation of their oath and the violation of the oath of every one of their subordinates. It was illegally released by Daniel Ellsberg and Anthony Russo to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. The Pentagon Papers illustrated how various administrations had systematically lied about the war to the public, but also to Congress. Likewise, later under Nixon, the U.S. had secretly enlarged the scope of its actions in Vietnam with the bombings of Cambodia and Laos, none of which had been reported in the mainstream media. Most of the Pentagon staff knew that the war couldn't be, quote, won, unquote, but were terrified about the U.S. being labeled as losers. They kept sending troops after the Pentagon Papers had been submitted to them in order, they said, to get the Vietnamese to the peace talks, where they negotiated for four years while 29,000 more American soldiers died. The lies and obfuscations continued. A year after the release of the Pentagon Papers, President Nixon directed the heaviest bombing of North Vietnam of the war. As the Pentagon Papers tell us, those in charge of the war knew we couldn't win, yet they kept fighting for years. Why? There are many rationalizations, but it is this feature of the Vietnam War which most haunts us today. Recent documents indicate a similar phenomenon in Afghanistan. Military and political leaders privately acknowledging that the war is unwinnable, yet making rosy public assessments and supporting further escalation. If there are lessons from the Vietnam War, it seems clear those in charge refuse to learn them. Who finally stopped this unwinnable war? Who finally convinced the president, Congress, and citizens that it wasn't worth spending more money, suffering more humiliation, and losing more American lives on a futile and immoral war. First, there was the increasingly fierce resistance from active duty GIs and vets, both in Vietnam and at home. Second, the tireless civilian anti-war movement, started primarily by church groups and college and high school students, which lasted for nine years. And most important, there were the tireless fighters of the NLF, who eventually overpowered the U.S. military forces and ended the war, finally. In August of 1965, 61% of the U.S. population approved of American involvement in Vietnam. Just six years later, by May of 1971, it was exactly reversed. Now 61% thought our involvement was wrong. Perhaps the most dramatic evidence of the change was the GIs coming back from Vietnam who organized to end the war. Many came home with a mission to tell the truth about wartime atrocities being committed and to demand an immediate end to the killing. Active duty soldiers and their civilian supporters established GI coffee houses outside dozens of military bases throughout the U.S. There, soldiers and veterans could find each other and realize they were not alone. Together, they planned protests, marches, and demonstrations on base and off. More than 300 anti-war newspapers were published, packed with first-hand accounts from the front lines and damning information that the military brass tried to suppress. 
even in high schools in the late 60s, there were close to 500 underground newspapers. They were the social media of their time. The military hit back against the coffee houses and their underground newspapers. This often involved discharge, demotion, and transfer for the soldiers, and an increase in harassment by undercover FBI agents, local police, not to mention the hostility of the pro-military towns where many coffee houses were located. Some were bombed, others were burned to the ground by vigilantes. Beginning in 1967, returning GIs formed the national group VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, who led many of the anti-war marches and demonstrations. They organized the Winter Soldier Hearings in Detroit in 1971 to expose war crimes and atrocities they had witnessed or participated in. I've, I've never seen him thrown out of my airplane because it's behind me, but uh, we had a couple of guys used to blindfold the guys with safety wire mm -hmm. and pull them real tight and uh, used to have contests seeing how far they could throw the bound bodies out of the airplane and you know, throw one as far as he can and see if he can get the other one farther. I think every person who was in Vietnam was in the infantry used CS, which is a gas, chemicals, Willie Peter, that's white phosphorus. If we thought it might be VC infested or something like this, we'd uh, send in Willie Peter mortars and uh, this would start the uh, hooches burning and also kill people. It's probably one of the worst sights I've ever seen is a person that's been burned by Willie Peter because it doesn't stop. It just burns all completely through your body. The only way you can uh, end this uh, burning is to cut off the air. It's very difficult. In April of 1971, VVAW held its first national demonstration. More than 2,000 vets camped on the mall near the Capitol, lobbied Congress, and defied a Supreme Court order to disperse. One by one, they threw away more than 700 military medals and combat ribbons on the Capitol steps and made brief statements, sometimes emotionally, sometimes in icy, bitter calm. By the end of the war, it's estimated that more than one quarter of active duty soldiers had participated in the anti-war movement, a coalition of white, black, and Latino soldiers who helped to stop the Vietnam War. The GI and veteran movements are among the most important and the least talked about aspects of protest during the war. Though many veterans supported and still support the war, the amount of GI opposition was unprecedented in U.S. history. This war was also stopped by the largest civilian peace movement in American history, by young men who illegally burned their required draft cards, by those who escaped the draft to Canada and Sweden and did anti-war work there, by prayer vigils, by the women's strike for peace, by concerned clergy such as the Catholic priests Daniel and Philip Berrigan and their supporters who seized files from draft boards and set them on fire with homemade napalm, among many others. The movement was sustained by millions of college and high school students and civilians who held endless teach-ins, rallies, student walkouts and strikes, and huge mobilizations to stop the war. Additional involvement came from other groups, including educators, clergy, poets, performers, journalists, lawyers, and physicians. Popular depictions of the civilian anti-war movement suggest that protesters were mostly privileged white kids, but we should remember a different, much more diverse movement with broad participation across class, race, and generation. Groups such as the Black-Led Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the Chicano Moratorium explicitly framed their opposition to the war in class-based experiences of the draft and recruited within working-class communities, connecting their demands to end the war with problems of unemployment, affordable housing, policing, quality schools, and health care. It began with demonstrations in 1964 against the escalating role of the United States in Vietnam. It became a broad social movement over the next several years and helped shape the vigorous and polarizing debate on how to end the war. The actions were mainly peaceful, nonviolent events. In many cases, police used violent tactics against the demonstrators. 
As the presidents escalated the war, more troops, more bombing, more falsehoods about American intentions, the peace movement organized larger and more confrontational demonstrations. The first to oppose the war early on were members of traditional peace churches, like the Quakers, Amish, and Mennonites. They organized local vigils and offered free draft counseling. Rather than serve in the military, tens of thousands burned their draft cards or returned them to the selective service. Thousands of COs, conscientious objectors, did two years of alternative service or worked in the military in non-combat roles. Over 500,000 young men rejected the draft system and refused to be inducted into the military. 5,000 draft resistors went to prison. Imagine, at age 18, some were just 16 or 17, being forced to fly across the world to fight in a war in which you had no stake. Also consider what a radical transition relatively square kids in small towns across the U.S. must have made to devote themselves to anti-war work and maybe jail time. And ask yourself, in today's all-volunteer army, whether many of those who joined feel like they have no other good options for getting an education, health care, and having a decent life. Doing anti-war work meant giving speeches at teach-ins and rallies, writing pamphlets, articles and books, painting picket signs, circulating petitions and leaflets, demonstrating at army bases, lobbying Congress, testifying before war crimes hearings, researching corporate and university complicity, harboring deserters, organizing strikes, heckling generals and politicians, and going to prison for defying the draft. It's hard to convey the emotions that inspired these actions. Probably the most widely shared across the country was simply outrage. Some notable dates include on January 15, 1968, 5,000 women rallied in D.C., the first all-female anti-war protest. On March 17, 1968, in London, 400,000 protesters tried to storm the U.S. Embassy, and there were also big anti-war rallies in Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, China, Cuba, and Australia. On November 15, 1969, during the moratorium march on Washington, there were four million supporting protests around the country, later a hundred demonstrations a day. In April 1970, Nixon announced the U.S. incursions into Cambodia to destroy the jungle headquarters of the Viet Cong. There were 885 campus protests. Four to five million students participated, the largest in history. Four protesting students were killed at Kent State University by National Guard soldiers and two at Jackson State by local police. Nine others were wounded. In response, 536 colleges were shut down completely by protest, 51 for the entire year, on and on, year after year, until the war was over. Three decades later, Robert McNamara, who served as defense secretary for both Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, renounced his wartime claims. McNamara conceded that the United States had been, quote, terribly wrong to intervene in Vietnam. He wrote, If only he had known that Hanoi was not the pawn of Beijing or Moscow. If only he had realized that the domino theory was wrong, he might have persuaded his bosses to withdraw from Vietnam. Why didn't experts like McNamara know what was obvious to so many others? Millions of lives could have been saved. It's hard to fathom, and harder, maybe impossible, to believe or forgive him. Ward Just, from the foreword to his 1968 book, To What End, wrote, Of course the war was unwinnable. It was useless to fight the Vietnamese. They would have fought for a thousand years. 
In fact, the Vietnamese had been fighting against the Chinese, Mongol invaders, the French, the Japanese, again the French, and the U.S. since the 15th century. A thousand years is nothing to the Vietnamese. Finally, here's an amazing footnote about the anti-war movement, the Tinker story, a very hopeful story. Early in the war, in December 1965, in Des Moines, Iowa, a student, John Tinker, age 15, his sister Mary Beth, age 13, along with a friend, 16-year-old Chris Eckert, held a meeting one evening and after much discussion, made a decision to wear black armbands to school to publicize their objections to the Vietnam War and to support an extension of the 12-hour Christmas truce that had been called for by the North Vietnamese and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. The three students wore simple black armbands to school on a Monday morning. Each was confronted by the administration of their school who asked the students to remove them. All three refused, and each was immediately suspended from school. Through their parents, the students sued the school district for violating their right of expression, as protected in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. But the local court dismissed the case and held that the school's actions were reasonable in order to uphold school discipline. Then the U.S. Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. The families were approached by the American Civil Liberties Union, which helped the students bring a freedom of speech suit against the school board to the U.S. Supreme Court. Here's just a little of the testimony by the justices and the Tinker lawyers. Just listen for a while. Uh, what if the student had gotten up in the class he went to and uh, delivered the message orally that uh, his armband uh, was intended to convey and insisted on doing it? I think in that case... All your, during the hour. Yes, in that case, Your Honor, we would not be here, even if he insisted on doing it only for a second, because he would clearly be... Uh, although he would be expressing his views, he would be doing something else. Why did they wear the armband to the class? To express that message? To express the message, yes, To everybody in the class? To everyone in the class, yes, and everybody, while they were listening to some other subject matter, was supposed to also be uh, looking at the armband and taking in that message? Well, to the extent that they would see it, but I don't believe there was any... I don't believe that the... Well, it wasn't they were intended to see it, weren't they? Policy was adopted. Uh, frankly, for the purpose uh, and the... Uh, the administrators and the teachers say this over and over again. It was the principle of the demonstration, the idea of expressing political beliefs that they were opposed to in this context. The Vietnam War and the involvement of the United States therein has been a subject of a major controversy for some time. When the armed band regulation involved herein was promulgated, a protest march against the war had recently been held in Washington, D.C., a wave of draft card-burning incidents protesting the war had swept the country. A former student of one of our high schools was killed in Vietnam. Some of his friends are still in school. It was felt that if any kind of a demonstration existed, it might evolve into something which would be difficult to control. Do we have a city in this country that hasn't had someone killed in Vietnam? No, I think not, Your Honor, but I don't think it would be an explosive situation in most, situ uh, most cases, but if someone is going to appear in court with an armband here protesting the thing, that it well, could be explosive. That's know. the situation we find. It could in. be. What? It could be. Is that your position? Yes. It could and be. there was no evidence that it would be? Is that the rule you want us to adopt? No, not at all, Your Honor. I think the, the rule that You might have grandparents who fought in the war or who resisted it and tried to shut it down to stop the destruction and the murder and the lies. Now in 2022 or later, it's about time to set the record straight. Start protesting. You kids might have to stop a war someday.
Jill. Thank you for sharing that. Whoop. <laughs> um, and with that, uh, Ricky, would you like to start? Um, would you like to come on? Great. Um, as I uh, said, thanks, Jill, uh, for the film. And uh, a reminder that we hope that you're chiming in. And having done these with Jill before, uh, you know, if you're comfortable turning on your camera, that's great for some of the warmth and offering your questions out loud, that also can help. Uh, but Jill, we'll start with, um, we're gonna tie into your book later on for sure, but your book talks about recalibrating histories um, as something that is important for documentaries to do. And I'm wondering, how you look at this film as a recalibration or generally what's at the core of that idea and your approach to making films about uh, events in the past. Okay, big time. Well, this is not like any other film I've ever made. Um, and I made it, as I said at the beginning, uh, to offer a a vehicle for high school teachers to teach the Vietnam War, which is why it's 44 minutes long. Um, so, and that was the original inspiration um, after watching about two hours of the Ken Burns 17 hour film. So um, it was always the idea to make something of what what's called classroom length. And that took me into this kind of form, it's, it turns out that no war has had such extraordinary photography as the Vietnam War. You won't find that in any war since, but it was photographed brilliantly. So I could just use photographs um, instead of interviews or any such thing and just proceed a pace, go through the uh, tactics, um, and the history and whatever else I put in this film, I don't know, but that was the idea. It's it's quite informational um, and unlike anything I've ever made before, probably won't make anything like it again, but it seemed important to try to make a film that was of that length and basically took it all in. So mm -hmm. that's what happened. Yeah, with that, when you... I can't hear you. He's muted. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Apologies. Um, in talking about photography, um, you have the the statement at the end. Thank you for the brave photographers. And when I think of your work, I think of how you often uh, lift up or focus on artists um, and the work that they do, you know, if it's Louise Nevelson or Ron Vodder or Faroki or the Popovich brothers. And here it really feels like you are celebrating the photographers who are doing um, or capturing the war and the events around it. Uh, just on a production note, uh, how would you go about collecting these photographs? What was your process of selecting them and even, you know, how long they're staying on the screen. How did you, what was your, what was your thinking behind those? Well, um, I have to admit, I didn't pay for those photographs, didn't pay any rights for them, didn't seek out the owners of those photographs. I just took a huge chance that um, nobody would come after me. So that's the first thing I have to say about it. They, it's amazing how much is online. Uh, you you can say the Vietnam War and, and find five thousand excellent photographs from the Vietnam War. So it's like I said, it's extremely unusual war in that it was photographed so brilliantly. Um, and I preferred that for in this case for this film, uh, and I had the opportunity to find those photographs. Uh, and not pay for this, not yet. Nobody's come after me yet, which is why there's that title near the end of the film that thanks them profusely for their great photography. And I'm praying that does the truth, so. 
But any, anyway, so I had photographs, I had my voice, and that's it, you know, and I went from there and uh, found photograph for every occasion that I wanted it, you know, remarkably. So um, I don't know what else, what else did you ask me? Um, well, the... I, I think there's actually a question kind of in the chat, just how the how the film kind of pulled together. Were you using the images? You you wrote your script and then you come with the images. Like, how'd you do the selection? How'd you decide how it was edited, how long they were going to stay on screen? Uh, just some of the, the choices you were making in the process. I have no idea. I was making them in the process. <laughs> I didn't have any rules. Um, but there were plenty of photographs to support what I was doing. Um, certainly in the anti-war movement, there were plenty, but also in our, our the sequence is, uh, I think it's chapter two, basically, our strategies, you know, Agent Orange, Napalm, Free Fire Zones, there was plenty of that as well, you know, like, like I said, I'm not sure I would try and make a film like this about another war, but this what this war produced photography like no other war, I think. Um, and I always found what I was looking for. So um, so that's what happened. Uh, you were active in the anti-war movement. Yeah. And still are active in various anti-war movements. Yeah. Um, how did your activism uh, inform your filmmaking, do you think, you know, throughout your career? You know, what did you learn from activism? You push students to be activists. You know, what are you hoping, you know, what are the lessons of activism that you hope they learn um, uh, in that, when they do that? Well, I put that in the end of the film where I ask students to start protesting. There are a million things to protest about uh, these days. And uh, I thought it was important to do that. I was, I'm still surprised that I did that kind of ending to the film, um, but I did it and uh, it seemed important after going through, you know, 40 minutes of uh, anti-war work. It, it it didn't shut down that war, but it sure it was sure there all the time. The I'm talking about the anti-war movement, um, but particularly the, the GIs coming back. That's never happened before in a in a war, American war, and I wanted I wanted people to know that everybody thinks it's college students, you know. Like, putting flowers in front of GIs, you know, handing flowers out. It, it was much more about returning GIs and their coffee houses and their newspapers. Um, and that's a story that I don't think has been told. So that seemed really important to put in the film. Is that right? The people don't know that, don't know that, um, what's that? What's that leg flopping around? <laughs> Lucy, my cat just made an appearance on camera. Oh, that was a cat? Yeah. <laughs> it, looked like, it looked like a human leg. Anyway. Um, She's a person in some ways, but. I see. Um, I forget where I was now. Um, so between the availability of that many photographs and uh, and what I wanted to do, I I just did it. I, I'm still surprised that I did it. I mean, it's, I think I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't heard about the fact that Ken Burns 17 hour Vietnam War had been sent to every high school system in the country. When I heard that, I said, not, not good enough. I've got to make a film uh, that's useful. That's always been my key word, useful. I wanted to make a useful film that uh, any high school teacher who had one hour to teach the Vietnam War, which is impossible, 
would have something to start with, you know, that was 40, 44 minutes long and still have enough less, less left to talk about it with students. I mean, I, you know, the involvement of high school and college students in this war was, as I try and say in the film, critical, absolutely critical. And I wanted students to feel that it would be critical again if the right occasion came back and there was uh, the motivation to take it on. So, um, so that's where I ended up. Um, but I, you know, it's not a film I understand very well myself, <laughs> but it seemed like an important film. Uh, and I thought from the beginning about high school teachers having to teach this 20 year long war, uh, which made no sense from beginning to end, but which was perpetrated for 20, 20 years, killed 380 million Vietnamese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It seemed important to end the film with that encouragement to um, protest, not just war wars, but, you know, food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's what I did, much to my own surprise. <laughs> Have you heard from teachers or students? Um, like, uh, what what's the the response? I don't think we have any high school. I, I don't know, but as someone who's uh, was never really a high schooler, but um, uh, but is not a high school teacher or a high schooler now, I I'm wondering what you've heard from them uh, who've used it or watched it. Yeah, uh, I have experiences. What do they say? Maybe. 10 different teachers have written me, thank you, Jill, thank you, thank you. Um, imagine trying to teach the Vietnam War in one class. Uh, good luck, so all they have to do is show the film. It's all there, you know? I think it's all there. So um, yeah, they've been quite grateful and in, uh, in the reception, reception of the film. I'm not sure I'd ever do that again, but I, I did it. Um, so, the big problem is distribution. You know, I I, uh, I wanted to offer it for free, which eliminates any distributor if there would have been one. So, and if anybody has, has any ideas about how to distribute it um, and get it to those high school teachers, let me know. But it's that's been the big stumbling block so far. Um, I don't know how to directly get it to the teachers, you know. Uh, it's impossible to find a list of high school teachers who, who are teaching history anywhere, unless somebody knows something I don't know. So, um, so that's a big problem. Um, so I found a way here, a way there, here and there. I've found ways to offer it for free to this organization and that organization. But it's if I had a list of every high school teacher in even in New York City, I would I would get to them immediately. But you can't find that list, you know. So um, that's been the biggest problem is distribution. <clears throat> Jill, did you um Try facets Chicago International uh, Children's Film Festival to see if they have any kind of list. Good question, and I know them well, so I I should absolutely try it the minute I get off this interview. <laughs> um, Jill, uh, Sarah from Media Burn also suggests the Zen Project, the Zen Education Project, as in Howard Zen. Yeah, uh, no, I I've been working with them. Um, I've offered, you know, I've offered it to them. They're a little hesitant. They're, you know, they're into this or they're into that, whatever. But they haven't taken, taken it up. But I, I do know them well. Um, if if I could ask a question, it's such a powerful film, but it also feels it, it's such a powerful film that incorporates so much information. Yeah. But it feels not just in terms of running time, completely different from something like 
Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's Vietnam War series. Yeah. And I'm wondering how much the desire to offer an alternative perspective, a different kind of documentary, a different kind of account, um, fed into your desire to want to make something like this for students, for teachers. It was the main reason I made it. When I when I heard that Ken Burns had sent it to every high school system in the country, I said, not good enough. How can they use it? 17 hour film. I mean, I couldn't use it at a university where I taught for 20 years. I couldn't, I couldn't use anything like that. Yeah, but Jill, kind of to Adam's question, if if Ken Burns makes a 45 minute documentary, you're not gonna want to show that either, right? Like that's what I was getting at. Yeah. <laughs> right. I see. Uh right. Um I don't know what it would look like exactly, but it wouldn't be the film that I would offer teachers. Um, they just need information, you know, and they, and uh, and pictures. That was the amazing thing about making a film about the Vietnam War. There are pictures of everything, which is extraordinary. But but there they are. I mean, of all the wars you could try and make a film about, this would be the war that you could do it because I don't actually know the, the history of why these photographers were allowed in to every aspect of, of the Vietnam War. I don't know why that happened. Does anybody know that? Know that history? No. I should research that. Um, but I, I think they just weren't aware that so much was being recorded and photographed. But I think that's how it, it was. It wasn't until yeah. uh, Iraq that uh, photojournalists were had to be embedded with troops and not allowed to 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 shoot anything. Right. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of writing on that. Of uh, you know, in Vietnam, they they didn't realize what the images would in fact do. I think back to Dorothy at Lang and the internment of the Japanese in those photos. And then they learned from Vietnam not to never make the same mistake, right. but to never make the same mistake with about the photojournalists. Yeah. I I think that's right. I think that's right. But Thank God they weren't on to it in Vietnam. I mean, it's amazing what you can find. You can you can find images of everything in the war in Vietnam, everything. It's all there. I didn't know that before I made the film, but um, just Google Vietnam War and see what happens. You know, you'll get 5,000 photographs. <clears throat> so it's, it is an amazing, amazing thing to my benefit. Um, um, yeah. We have a question from the chat. Um, Mavish wonders um, if your creative process differed significantly for this project from your previous uh, films and videos. Absolutely. Uh, I'm still surprised myself that this film got made, and it and it really got made uh, when I heard that the Ken Burns 17-hour <coughs> Vietnam War was being sent to uh, every high school system in the country. I mean, that was just absurd, an absurd idea, and uh, and it made me want to make something that teachers could use. Um, and that's what I did. And I hope they use it because it's a pretty good vehicle for starting at least to talk about this war. A war that, you know, if you ask Jill, is the most immoral war that the United States has ever perpetrated as far as I'm concerned. I think if you just watch the film, you know what I'm talking about. I don't, have to elaborate on that subject, but um, when you go through those tactics, um, 
that that does the trick you know there's just nothing else to say so uh that was that was literally the motivation to to, to make something usable uh for teachers who have i don't know an hour and 10 minutes in a high school class to discuss the vietnam war i think i gave them a beginning a place to start i hope i have but as I said, distribution, anybody have any ideas, let me know. Um, I do think that word of mouth is important for anybody who knows high school teachers or even high school students. Who let them know about this movie. Um, with so much talk about students and teachers, Ricky, would you mind telling us a little bit about Jill as a teacher, since we took classes with her? Um, oh, God. Way back when? Um, well, I remember I took, uh, two classes and Jill being Jill, uh, she found a, a loft space that was almost like a, a bell tower, a clock tower and turned it into a classroom in her office. And this was the 2000s. So you shouldn't be smoking, but, um, there's a lot of smoking, <laughs> um, and, uh, an Iranian, uh, Iranian film class. A documentary class and it was great because you watch a movie we would smoke cigarettes afterwards and talk until you know one or two in the morning and I got to learn a lot about the film itself and then I got to learn some like campus dirt and <laughs> like learn the inner workings of the university and the institution where I was and then you talk about world politics and uh, it was a graciousness that you know you get you get maybe one or two of those at a campus you know tops um to have someone who really cares about you as a person and wants to teach you not just about how to make films but how to be a good kid and that was uh that was a rarity and it was really wonderful to to have that combination of um learning about life and movies at the same time it's yeah, it was amazing. I should say that um, if I hadn't taught classes in documentary, Iranian cinema, whatever, for 20 years, I could not have written the book and maybe couldn't have made that film. That I learned so much about what I was teaching <laughs> from teaching. It's a strong recommendation that filmmakers teach because, you know, they're confronted with everything, not just their own work, but work of other filmmakers. And they get to think about it and speculate and come up with theories that I don't think I would have developed if I hadn't taught for 20 years, in, in particular documentary. Um, so that is a strong recommendation to teach as a way of learning uh, to think about your subject. Um, Jill, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your documentary or uh, about your book. Um, you mentioned that you, you know, taught documentary filmmaking classes um, for decades. Uh, you're known as a documentary filmmaker. Your book, your most recent book is called Kill the Documentary. Right. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this. Uh, it's, it's a very inspiring book. Uh, it's a very provocative book. Um, and uh, as I said in the introduction, it is uh, Media Burn approved and endorsed. And we highly <laughs> recommend anybody here go out and read it because it's it's not just like intellectually stimulating. It's also very fun in some ways. But I'm wondering if you just tell people a little bit about what it is and what inspired you to write it. Well, like I just said, it, it came out of teaching. I don't think I could have written the book if I hadn't had to stand up in front of 30 students and ex ex expound on the on documentary. But it, what it does is basically strongly critique the documentary as we know it and find enormous fault with it and end up recommending something called I called post-realist cinema which is very hard to explain, and I'm not sure I'm going to try that right now. But 
um, it's a critique of documentary uh, as a form of filmmaking that is, I argue, intended to produce its customers or its audience as uh, to feel like concerned activist citizens of the world because they saw this documentary or that documentary without them having to do anything. But it's that that's the real purpose of the documentary as we know it um, is to produce an audience of people who feel that they've been enlightened because they, they watch that documentary. And I would argue that they're not enlightened at all. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to reduce it to a, a minute, but uh, so I'm, I'm proposing the film a different kind of nonfiction, what I call post-realism, which involves uh, using the form of the film as the critique and not just Here's how it looks when a farmer can't afford to buy genetically engineered seeds. What a tragedy. And we all go, oh, tragedy, tragedy. Uh, that's the, the general action of the documentary as we know it, and not something that's more useful than that. That's the argument. And I'm arguing that there is a form of nonfiction that could be much more useful and isn't only concerned with producing an audience of people who can feel that they're educated somehow because they saw images of this and images of that and images of that. So that's what the book's about. It's called Kill the Documentary. It was originally called uh, Useful Film and How to Make Useful Film, How to Make One. And one of the, uh, a woman who's on the editorial board at Columbia found this, I think it was a 10 year old article I'd written called Kill the Documentary and said, wait a minute, we got to call this book Kill the Documentary. And that's, that's what happened. I fought it like crazy. And then eventually I, I gave up my struggle and that's what it's called now. It's a little rough for me. I don't not com commonly use the word kill, but um, that's what happened. So it's 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 really an argument against the documentary as a useful, the traditional documentary as a useful uh, project, other than that it produces an audience of people, of self-satisfied people who feel that they know and care about a situation now because they watch the documentary and that there's so much more than a nonfiction film could do in the direction of what I call post-realist. So, so that's what the book's about. And that's why it's called that. With plenty of examples and a recommendation that you go seek some of these films I call post-realist and see what the difference is between them and the documentary as we know it, which we all know what that looks like since we've seen a thousand of them. Did I answer your question? Oh, yes, absolutely. Sorry. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> Say, Jill, this is, I mean, this is the work of the book. Uh, I, I was wondering if you know when you talk about useful film, do you have a do you have a quick idea in your mind what useful means? Like how you how you think of that, or um, and you know if people read the book, they'll find out you know over the course of many pages. But distilling it, like when you think of useful, what what comes to mind for you? Well, to be enlightened. <laughs> about what produces uh, the systems uh, that control things in this country, you know? So something that opens that up, instead of just saying, here's that farmer with his, you know, expensive seeds that he can't afford, you know, that produces, that shows us the structures that produce those seeds, 
et cetera, et cetera, or that produce that war, whatever. That's why there's a pretty long sequence in, in the film we just watched about why the United States did this thing 8,000 miles away. Um, you know, a land base in Asia, commodities, impossible to separate from the Cold War and all of that, you know, being stuck in that form. Um, those are the important things, you know. So, so that's what I'm encouraging, you know, forms that would go beyond the evidence, the physical evidence of whatever situation and be able to show us and help us think much more in a much bigger sense about what, what produces that situation, what produces that war, what produces this, what produces that. So that's what I'm interested in. And you don't find that in the, uh, in the, in the standard documentary. You just get to look at the farmer in his front of his field or you know, the prisoners of war, or the, I don't know, I can, can't make it up right now, but, um, and weep, we get to weep a little bit in some documentaries, but we don't get to learn what's, produ what's produced that situation. That's what I mean of, of, about a useful film, would show us in a much more profound way how to think about how that is produced and that's never there in the documentary as we know it. That's never there. It's just the, uh, the opportunity to weep or to celebrate in that case, or to be jealous. <laughs> I always think about the documentaries about rich people and why people like them too. But um, anyway, that, I don't know, have I got to it? Did I get it? <laughs> I yeah. So. yeah, I think that's right. It's complicated. Mm. It, it, it is complicated. We're so used to the documentary as we know it that it's, it's, but there's a list of films in the book that are worth looking up and, and where to find them actually um, that would, that are much more productive, let's say, than the documentary as we know it. Um, I made up a word for the documentary as we know it. Now I'm trying to think what it is. D, A, well, I can't do it right now. <laughs> the the docky, the docky. The docky, D-A-W-K-I, something like that. Just so I didn't have to spell out the documentary as we know it every time I wanted to refer to it. The docky, D-A-W-K-I, I think it is. Um, just so, you know for ease. <clears throat> um, I, I think we should uh, probably wrap it up here. Um, but uh, before we go, um, I do want to recommend a couple of very useful documentaries from Jill. Um, not just, uh, you know, obviously the one you just watched, which please get the word out about it, but um, The Inextinguishable Fire, which is another film about Vietnam, but also a dialogue with Harun Faroqi's The Inextinguishable Fire. Um, I'm sorry, Jill's film is called What Faroqi Taught, um, <clears throat> that changed the way that I thought about what documentary language could do and the ways that documentary could comment on both the language of cinema as well as the world you know, more broadly in history, um, mm. but also f Far From Poland, which is just a very lovely film that I feel like is not, um, it's not watched enough. Um, That's and, my favorite film of all the films I've made, so I'm glad you picked it up. Well, I would, uh, it's worth cracking down for a million reasons, um, uh, but uh, it's also earned you, what was it, a knighthood from Poland? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have been knighted by the <laughs> president of Poland who was gone four months after he knighted me. 
Well, if, if that's if that's not the best line that you could possibly find on a resume, I don't know what. <laughs> um, but this was this was really lovely, Jill. Thank you so much for this film. It's really powerful and um, hopefully very useful for people as well. Um, and yeah. and I saw people my age sitting there trying to remember all that stuff about Vietnam, you know, shaking their heads, you know. It's, you know, I mean, I lived through it. I was a major anti-war person in college, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there was stuff I didn't know that's in the film. <laughs> like, um, and thank you, thank you very much, Ricky, um, for uh, handling the moderating duties. This was a really lovely event. Um, I uh, uh, will see folks again in two weeks, if you would uh, like to come to our next event with Judith Binder, talking about CamNet and independent TV in the 1990s. Um, everybody have a wonderful night. Thanks for coming, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. Ciao.